Hi, everyone. Um, I think we're ready to go. Um, Lizzie is very helpfully uh, keeping an eye on uh, people coming and going. And um, we just thought we'd wait a few minutes just to give everyone a chance to get through the virtual doors. Um, I'm really, really happy to um, be chatting to you all tonight. Um, and uh, thank you so much to all the folks who've been organising One Planet Week um, and for the opportunity to speak to you about this. Um, what I'm going to be uh, talking to you about this evening um, are a few sites that some of you may be familiar with if you're archaeologists or if you're local to North Yorkshire, um, or in fact, even if you've been watching Digging for Britain lately. And um, I'd like to talk to you about them uh, in relation to how we might uh, see the way in which people lived their lives around 11,000 years ago and whether or not we can draw on this uh, to inform the ways in which we might view our own situation and indeed even find solutions uh, to our uh, current climatic predicaments, if not at least being able to stop it, uh, but ways of approaching and adapting and changing um, in order to deal with these kinds of things. Now, I promised that this would be interactive. It's not going to be quite as interactive as um, I intended if we were all going to be in person, uh, but it does mean that a great many more of you can actually uh, be here tonight and uh, I can still uh, chat to you a bit and um, be interactive. So please, please, please uh, put questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, I think we've got a question and answer session planned for the end. But I've also got a couple of polls. Now, if um, I know I've been I've been doing Zoom for longer than I'd ever thought I'd ever want to uh, through the course of um, the uh, these last few years, uh, and uh, I've not really done polls very often, but hopefully we're going to be doing some polls, and um, I'd like to yeah just get your opinions and your on ideas on kind on things, just to be able to. Um, understand what it is that you know about uh, life in the past um, and how you think uh, this um, this might be important to us in the present day. So uh, without further ado, I think I'll uh, make a start and hopefully I can see everything on my screen and you can see my screen. Um, Lizzie, it would be great if you could shout out if you can and if there's anything that you can see on there that you shouldn't be able to see. I'm going to take that as a no. Can everyone hear and see the screen OK? I can see a chat, a message in the chat. Yes, yes, we can see it. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Wonderful. OK, so I will crack on. So the first um, thing I want to talk to you about is something called traditional ecological knowledge. And this is just something that's going to form a bit of a, uh, a, a bit of a, a, a background and something that I just you want you to bear in mind as we go through uh, the next few slides and in the next sort of um, half an hour, 45 minutes or so, uh, to think about the ways in which people interacted with their environment and their landscape in the past. Because traditional ecological knowledge is something that is becoming, has always been around, but is something that is now becoming increasingly uh, aware, um, the, aware of as, as scientists and, um, and as communities and multivocal uh, participants are coming to the debates around climate change, uh, thinking about adaptation and resilience. So there's no really universal definition of traditional ecological knowledge. But it, overall, it's, um, it's a, it essentially encompasses um, understanding, practices, knowledge, of course, uh, beliefs and the relationships that are held between people and their environment. And it is something that is ever evolving. And it is something that has been developing over hundreds to potentially thousands of years among largely indigenous societies. And it is also unique to um, particular cultures and societies in particular regions. And here it is, um, we see that those, the, the, the knowledge that it encompasses and the beliefs and the relationships between the, these peoples, their environments and non-human organisms, be that plants, be that animals, be that minerals, is non-extractive. So it is, it is not taking away from, um, from the, 
the, the place, the environment, uh, that which cannot be replenished, and it is based um, on the fundamental tenet of mutual respect. So this is something that I just want you to kind of bear in mind as we go through this, um, and as it's, as it's a very, very important aspect of understanding hunting and gathering communities, which is largely what I'm going to be talking about from the past, but also ways in which people have relationships with their environments through to the present day as well. So at the risk of um, grossly generalising something, a discipline that is absolutely enormous and very, very broad, that is that hunting and gathering lifeways are something that has been practised by humans and their ancestral relations, so our other cousins in the hominin um, lineages, that they have lived this way by hunting and gathering for millions and millions of years. Farming and pastoralism, which is something that is far more familiar to uh, people in the 21st century, is that it's something completely recent, really, in the whole grand scheme of things. It is really, really quite recent. Domestication of dogs happened probably around 16,000 years ago, so as companion animals. Um, however, domestication of plants and, and animals for food production is only really known um, from around about 11,500 years ago. Um, and that's within the Levant, within uh, the Fertile Crescent, so around Iraq, Iran and Syria, with uh, cereal crops and cows and sheep and goats, but then also in South America with potatoes, squashes, um, beans, pulses, um, also from the Levant as well. Um, but yeah, back in South America, it's tomatoes, potatoes and um, then uh, maize, and then also in Southeast Asia with, uh, with rice and, uh, and millet. So really domestication pops up um, around in various, various places um, and it moves and these life ways spread. Um, now it's not to say that people become predisposed to agriculture if they're living uh, by um, people who practice these life ways. There are very, very complex and in, uh, interrelated relationships between people who live through hunting and gathering uh, some largely subsistence base and people who practice uh, farming and pastoralism and indeed there might be some crossover as well uh, but largely the the farming and pastoralism is something that has become dominant um, as a means of subsistence across the world as a consequence societies that live largely by hunting and gathering uh, subsistence practices now occupy increasingly marginalised environments. It is from these societies that we can learn a lot, but it would be remiss to ever take these societies as uh, indicative of, 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 of as fossilised cultures of a, a time that is past. They're very much of the here and now and of the present day, and their voices are very, very important in understanding the ways in which people have lived, uh, but also uh, the, the complex interactions that they live within an ever-changing environment and the impact that that has on their life ways, but also the impact it has on life ways surrounding uh, farming and pastoralism as well, as climate change also affects not only the global climate, but also um, uh, particularly food crops on which uh, forms the basis of subsistence. So what I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you the first question uh, to, uh, to tell, well, not, I'm not testing your knowledge. Um, it's, it's, it's completely um, not like that. Um, I'm just interested in, in, in finding out and understanding how people uh, think or what they might know or what, what they might assume about hunting and gathering societies from the past. So I'd like you just to imagine for a moment, trying to picture a person from about 11,000 years ago that lived in North Yorkshire. What do you think their life was like? What do you think their relationship was like with their environment? Do you think they were thriving or do you think they were just surviving? Now, if I get my poll right, um, and I'm gonna ask it now, I'm gonna launch this poll. Um, and uh, I don't know how, how long I'll give you to answer it, just maybe a, a minute or so. Um, I'll give you a, a minute or so, but yeah, there's oh, lots and lots of responses coming through, goodness me. Um, this is uh, this is very interesting. Um, I'm not sure if anyone can see the results, uh, but uh, I can, and uh, yeah, they're quite quite interesting. Um, I'll give it up uh, another thirty seconds or so um, to to leave the rest of you to participate. Should you wish, of course, you you, you don't have to participate if you don't wish. 
for those of you who may not be able to see the poll on screen or if you're if you're just listening in, um, I'm, I'm asking about um, life in the Mesolithic. So in the Middle Stone Age, and this is the period that we're going to be focusing on, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a few slides time. Uh, but what I'm asking you is, um, yeah, is whether or not you think that people 11,000 years ago were totally thriving or were scarcely surviving. So um, I am going to end the poll there. We've had a, uh, yeah, we've been open for a minute. I'm going to end it now. Um, and very, very interestingly, we have a 70-30 split. Um, and that 70-30 split is between um, the 70% of you think that pe uh, people during this time period, 11,000 years ago, were totally thriving. And 30% of you felt that they were scarcely surviving. So I'm going to end that now. I can share the results so uh, you can see that I'm not fibbing. So there we go. Very, very interesting. Um, and um, of course, really like to talk to you more about that um, in the question and answer session. So um, I'm also interested to see if your opinion might change over the course of the next few slides. So I'm going to end that poll there um, and I'm going to move on and introduce you to um, a selection of, um, of uh, rather scary looking maps and graphs in the first instance. So this is um, the first map that I want to, to show you. And basically, this is what Northern Europe essentially looked like at the height of the last glacial maximum. So around about, uh, give or take, 20,000 years ago, this is what Northern Europe looked like. Um, North Yorkshire was pretty much sat around about under a mile or so of ice, at least York was sat under about a mile of ice. Um, so uh, we've all been through the depths of winter, it would have been pretty chilly um, outside. But spring is coming, which is great, because we're kind of going to think about a climatic spring as we fast forward a few thousand years. And this is what we do as archaeologists all the time. We leap and bound by um, thousands of years uh, at a time. This is the period known as the Pleistocene. So we can see that most of Northern Europe is completely covered by glaciers, all the way down to pretty much the south of Ireland, uh, reaching all the way, covering pretty much all of Wales uh, and, and carving out through um, up the Pennines uh, over North Yorkshire and pretty much uh, taking out all of Scotland. Those unglaciated areas, you'll see um, that there is a pale blue across where the North Sea should be. That is a huge um, uh, glacial lake. Um, and you'll also see that there is a terrestrial land bridge connecting Britain to the continental mainland. And people during this time were had moved south. So humans, us, our species, Homo sapiens, had already moved up into this environment um, and had been living here for the better part of about 20,000 years already. Um, but then um, they moved south uh, as, as these temperatures started to get a lot colder um, and pretty much hung out in, well, the south of France, northern Spain. Lovely, nice, nice, uh, warm conditions um, and uh, yeah, living their best lives uh, during these last, this last glacial maximum. So um, I'm going to show you an even more scary uh, looking um, looking graph. Now, this is um, something that's taken um, from the, the Greenland ice core. So a huge ice core was drilled through one of the, um, the, the, uh, the glaciers in Greenland. And this has been uh, extracted and analysed. And basically what you're seeing here is something called an oxygen isotope graph. Now, I'm not an archaeological scientist. I'll hold my hands up. I can't say I know a huge amount about oxygen isotopes, um, but I do know this particular oxygen isotope is quite heavy um, and it correlates quite broadly to temperature. So what we're looking at is 50,000 years of climatic fluctuation correlated to temperature. And we can see that these peaks uh, where it's um, a pale orange red, it's nice. It gets quite warm, relatively speaking. Um, and the troughs where it gets really, where it gets blue is where it gets quite cold. Um, and this little blue square that's appeared on your screen, that is the period in which the, the map in the previous slide uh, encompassed. So we can see this is really, really very cold, relatively speaking. 
so um, we're definitely talking, yeah, um, tundra like landscapes and uh, definitely the need for clothes and uh, pretty much, uh, yeah, very, very, very cold conditions. So what's quite interesting is that as this, uh, this time period extends and as we move towards um, the, the, the present day, from around about, um, about 16, 15,000 years ago, things really, really start to warm up. We start to get um, some warming. Um, and this is where people start to move into Northern Europe again. So they think, oh yeah, okay, well, um, we've had enough of the Algarve, like let's, let's, let's start heading up um, into northerly latitudes and see what's going on there. Likely following migrating herds of, uh, of uh, woolly mammoth, of reindeer, of, of woolly rhinos. And um, all these big uh, ice age megafauna. So very, very different species than we're familiar with in the present day. But that's not all straightforward. Um, what happens is that actually there's kind of a last hurrah of the, the ice age around about 12,000 years ago, um, and things get very, very cold and near glacial conditions return to Northern Europe again. So it lasts for about a thousand years before we get um, something called the Holocene, and in massive, massive increase in temperatures um, and change in climates, but that's not without climatic cold blips. So a little arrow appeared on your screens that says PBO, uh, 150 to 250 years. So whilst things got a lot warmer, there are little blips. So this is called the preboreal oscillation. It lasted for about 150 to 250 years and things got quite cold again relatively speaking, you'll notice I'm using that quite a lot. So it doesn't go all the way back to those glacial temperatures, but it certainly would have been noticeable. And what's quite interesting is in the green square that's just appeared on your screen now, this is the time period in which humans lived in North Yorkshire and uh, around about the time uh, that I'm going to be talking about. Things have changed um, a lot. So let's go and take a look at some of the um, of these interesting archaeological sites that are giving us this kind of information about this time period. Oh, and uh, and that's a new map. So this is kind of what it looks like um, by the time people are starting to live in North Yorkshire. So we can see that um, the ice uh, has retreated quite significantly, but we've still got a bit of a glacier hanging around over the highlands of Scotland um, and large parts of Fenno Scandinavia are also still covered by ice. But North Yorkshire, things, things are nice and warm there, and we've got a, still this long, large terrestrial um, land connection across to the continents, and there's a huge uh, freshwater ice lake over where the Baltic is. So things look a little bit different than, than we're familiar with. So this period that we're going to start talking about, as the Holocene has started, so this period of warming, is known as the Mesolithic. It's the Middle Stone Age. And this is the period of hunting and gathering in, in northern Eurasia that lasts from around about 11,000 years ago, so from when those ice caps retreat and those glaciers melt, to when the arrival of farming and domesticates and agriculture arrive. Um, and at the very latest in, in places like Britain, this is around about 6,000 years ago. But um, things don't become, uh, th things, things change rapidly, um, but they don't become perhaps what we're quite familiar with for quite some time. So first of all, we've got this period called the pre-boreal period, um, and this is where this significant climatic uh, warming occurred. So as we leave this ice age behind and that last little cold snap, we see average temperatures jumping between five to ten degrees within decades until they reach similar levels uh, to the present day. Now, if we reflect on the fact uh, that we're facing within climatic breakdown, catastrophic change with an increase of three degrees and that, that, um, that there are attempts to limit that warming to, well, we were hoping at least one or 1.5, but now increasingly two degrees, that this would have had a huge, huge change um, on terrestrial fauna, flora, and also sea levels, water tables, and all those kinds of things. So there has been enormous change to the landscape and the environments um, that people would have been familiar with on a very, very rapid scale. But 
We also know that it didn't keep getting warmer. We still had um, environmental fluctuations and, and climatic fluctuations uh, that, that precipitated this. So um, a, a cold snap, for example, that I mentioned that pre-boreal oscillation around about 11,300 years ago, that, that caused it. And what causes these oscillations, these very cold blips, is that is, this is due to these large pieces of ice breaking off, uh, melting into the sea and, and interrupting uh, the various uh, cycle, cycle can't say that word very well, uh, the cyclical nature of um, warm water transport uh, and uh, on a very, very generalized uh, scale, um, and also that which also has an impact on, on climate. So it means that uh, things can change very rapidly because as things get warm, that melts the ice, things break off, and it, it has such a, an effect, things get quite cold again um, until things warm back up again. Now, our environment, what is North Yorkshire looking like at this time? Well, um, it's pretty different um, than we uh, know today, but um, it, it would have changed. So we would have had a, a nice uh, big lake that I'm going to show you in a couple of slides. It would have been colonized by early stands of birch. So birch is a pioneer species. And we see that birch starts to move into this landscape and, and, and colonize with um, small areas of woodland, but also we've got sort of large open grasslands as well. And animals that would have lived here, at least from um, terrestrial fauna, so uh, things that we would uh, iconically think of people that would have, uh, of people hunting and gathering, would be aurochs, which are wild cattle, and, um, and red deer, and these kinds of things. So really quite um, an increasingly rich, perhaps, landscape that we might think of. Maybe early fish are starting to colonise the lake as well. Bird species are moving in. Um, but certainly a different type of biomass than we might think of uh, in comparison to the Ice Age. So for all that things were quite cold and tundra-like, they were very, very large mammals. These have mostly gone. The reindeer herds have retreated off up to northern Europe and they're being replaced by these more temperate species. So North Yorkshire. Definitely, as I mentioned, a, a, a bit different. So if you live, um, live here, if you've ever, ever visited, uh, here's a map on the left hand side just to situate yourself within the North Yorkshire coastline. And that's a brilliant seaside town of Scarborough and the, the beautiful North York Moors, then we have the what's the Vale of York and the Vale of Pickering. So we have this, this, this huge, huge valley. And into this valley would have drained the last vestiges of the ice uh, that once covered it. Um, and this would have formed a huge lake uh, called Lake Flixton. Um, and now, so the map on your left is showing you that, that lake overlain over the contemporary Ordnance Survey map. So we know now that it, there's the A64 that runs through. We've got a lot of farmers fields there. It's very, very agriculturally productive. So, but this would have been pretty huge. It would have been about um, uh, two kilometres wide, probably five kilometres long. So this is really, really interesting because it's giving us a very, very different picture of what life was like in the past. And farming has um, had a really interesting impact on the archaeology. And we're going to focus on two sites here. So we're going to look at Star Car, which is on the west, on the west shore of the lake, um, and then also a site called No Name Hill that is on uh, the, uh, within the centre of the lake, but on a small island. Now, before we do that, I just want to highlight the importance of peat. Now, peat's formation um, really began with the early sedimentation of the lake, as, of course, as it was filling up with, with water, and we have all these new plants and uh, plant species beginning to colonise in and around the, the landscape, you start to get sedimentation, so you get soil buildup. And as that begins, you start to get increasingly uh, shallower depths of the lake. And over the course of around about 800 years, then this lake gradually began to completely sediment up and dry out and was replaced uh, with, with uh, just with peaty materials, essentially. And this peat has been really, really important because by forming, it completely excluded the oxygen that was in the lake. And that means that the sites that are found here are 
some of the most unique in the country because of the level of organic preservation as a consequence of those anaerobic conditions of the oxygen being excluded. So it means that a lot of the things that we don't normally find on archaeological sites, such as bone, such as wood, such as plant material, we've even found leaves, which is just incredible, giving us a real sense of, uh, of what life and the environment was like at this time. But unfortunately, things are changing. Um, and uh, as a consequence of agricultural drainage, which is um, uh, not just recent, but um, historical, it means that the peat is shrinking as it's drying out. Uh, and also there's increasing acidification of the land as well, which is also beginning to destroy those organic remains. So the fact that these excavations have been taking place right now and over the, um, the last 50 to 70 years or so, means that uh, we've got a really, really strong insight into the archaeology here and also how the, 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 the threats to this archaeology and how we mitigate, might mitigate that in the future. So the first site we're going to come to is called Star Car. It may be familiar to some of you if you're archaeologists and you've studied on the course, if you live in North Yorkshire, you've probably driven past Star Car Fowl. Um, you may have wondered what was there. Well, I'm going to, going to show you. And, uh, and, and what the really, really exciting finds there uh, are telling us about life around the lake 11,000 years ago. So in the picture in front of you, this is taken from the excavation, and we can see that there's a paler area to the back, which was the dryland area, and um, a darker area to the front, which is the wetland area. And this is because the site is located right on the very edge of the lake. And through a, a long, long history of investigation, along the west uh, shore of, of the lake, we, there have been found incredible amounts of archaeological remains. Um, and the, the wetland area has preserved some incredible artifacts. So it was first identified in the 1940s by an amateur archaeologist uh, with the Scarborough Archaeological Society called John Moore. And he got in touch with, uh, who was to become Professor Graham Clark at, at the University of Cambridge. And uh, Clark took over those excavations whilst Moore did uh, excavations in other areas. Um, and Clark did those excavations between 1941 and 1951 um, and published in uh, the early 50s, continually going back and revising uh, his interpretations. And there's been a long, long history of investigation of people reanalyzing the remains that were found um, and also looking back over at different areas of the landscape. So uh, the Vale of Pickering Research Trust went there in the 1980s and did a lot of uh, field walking and test pitting and trying to find more about the wider archaeology around the areas that uh, Graham Clark had excavated. And then Nikki Milner, Professor Nikki Milner, who was the head of department at the, uh, the Department of Archaeology here in York, uh, headed up excavations between 2004 and 2014 with Chantal Canella, who's now at Newcastle University, and Barry Taylor, who's at the University of Chester. And they continued to investigate, not only looking back at where Clark had excavated before, and you can see this here in one of the um, the one of the, the pictures, uh, is that where Clark had uh, revealed some incredibly preserved wood, uh, but also expanding this as well. And what they found was just a mind-blowing array of artefacts that are separated across the dryland and the wetland. So I'm only going to give you a very, very brief overview because of time on what the kinds of things were that they found. But we can see that uh, from here, we've got the eastern structure, which is pictured. There were at least four structures that were identified that had been uh, occupied on the dryland. And the eastern structure is one of the most well-defined of this. So we've got a photograph here of a little depression that could be seen and the post holes have been partly excavated that would have held posts to uh, co for coverings for this structure. And then by plotting, as every single tiny piece of flint was excavated, by plotting it with a really, really high accru accuracy GPS, we were, they were able to I, see how densely clustered all the artefacts and all the, just the, daily debris of life of uh, people living in and around or working in the structure was was left in and around the site. Um, I don't know about you, but through lockdown, I spent a lot of time at home and um, I've come to realise that I am a very messy person. 
And that is something that is definitely very human. So uh, just um, yeah, going to take a, a good look around and, and, and see the, the, the debris of my life just scattered around me. Um, and this is just just similar, uh, exactly similar for people who lived 11,000 years ago. They left behind the material traces of, of their daily lives. And that's, that's what archaeology aims to explore. And we can see that within this, uh, this structure, perhaps a, a, a family group may have worked. It may have been used as a workshop. It may have been used by various people coming and going. And we can see how uh, all of this, uh, this activity is accumulated in and around it. And there was some charcoal that might suggest uh, there was a, a hearth as well. So a small fireplace was there. And by doing some really, really fine detail and microscopic analysis of the soils, tiny, tiny remains of plants were preserved that show that there was perhaps a, a layer, a matting of something like reeds or bracken uh, to, or moss to, to just cushion and, and soften that area so that people weren't work, walking around on the bare earth. Within this area as well, we have access to the lake that was facilitated by people cutting down timber, converting timber and laying platforms. Now, there's a bit of debate about what these platforms might have been used for. They were slightly submerged, so they weren't upstanding like a jetty but they facilitated access to the lake edge somehow, perhaps to extend um, and stabilize it as the, as the lake edge was changing and the environment was beginning to, to sediment around it and there was lots of vegetation buildup. It might've allowed people to get there for, to, to fish and, those, uh, and, and also do other activities. And we know that people kept coming back and adding to this uh, as the dates that have been obtained from these timbers show us that this was continually added to over a very, very long stretch of the lake over a a, quite a long period of time. And this shows us that partly there has been uh, just wood de detritus gathered up, so it just might be fallen, fallen sticks and trees have been, have been gathered up and, and things that have been washed to the edge of the lake. But there's also evidence for carpentry as well which shows that people were deliberately felling trees here and managing this um, and, and in order to be able to, to stabilise this area. And, and yeah, it's, the, it's quite cool because it's Britain's very first earliest evidence of carpentry, which is really amazing. And we also know that people were managing landscapes by um, burning as well um, and by looking at analysis of, of the uh, looking within the soils for things, something like things like pollen, as well as charcoal, by counting this and, and looking at the relative percentages, people, that scholars have been able to see how uh, people might have impacted the environment by burning quite close to the lake. So maybe that's to burn the reeds for, uh, for access and, and being able to clear an area that allowed them uh, better visibility, for example. So this is all very interesting in terms of being able to tell us how people were interacting with their, with their environment. What was also really interesting is that we've got some of the most iconic um, and unique uh, archaeological traces from this period in Britain. So not only in terms of the, the carpentry, not only some of uh, the earliest houses, but also some really, really enigmatic pieces as well. And what's very interesting is that these are found in the lake or just by this lake edge and, and mix and sometimes mixed in and around this platform. So we've got caches, we've got collections of partly worked stone tools. We've got careful and deliberate deposition of animal bones. Sometimes these are articulated together to suggest that they were still deposited with the, with the flesh on them. In one instance, there's almost an entire deer skeleton that is there, but actually by looking at all the different elements of the deer, Becky Knight, who did the uh, uh, the ana analysis of it, actually showed that there were two rear left legs, which is not normal in case you've not seen a deer. That's, um, yeah, just to put it out there, that's definitely not normal. So it's quite interesting because these are a collection, of perhaps of a single deer or multiple deer that have been deposited there. We have the uh, really, really iconic and quite enigmatic uh, red deer frontlets, which are on the bottom right of your screen. 
these are red deer skulls that have been deliberately modified. They've been trimmed down. There've been perforations put in the, uh, to make almost like eye sockets because with a deer, their eyes are on the side. This is not the normal place for eye sockets on a deer either. So they've been placed uh, in the front, which was, is more as we would imagine for, 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 for humans, perhaps they were used as masks. And also the antlers have been trimmed down and it's been suggested that this might have been to make them a little bit lighter if people were wearing them as a part of a ceremonial regalia, for example, perhaps as shamans, which has been interpreted in one way, or perhaps as a hunting disguise, which has been interpreted in another way, or perhaps both. And then we also have um, a really, really beautiful engraved pendant. And this pendant is made from shale, which is uh, very locally available. You can collect it from Robin Hood's Bay or Whitby, any of those neighbouring beaches. It's been brought to Starcar and it's been engraved with these beautiful barbed and line motifs. And what is really interesting is that these barbed and line motifs also appear on the continent within amber. So these are part of a much, much broader decorative tradition and stylistic tradition that is known from a large, large part of Northwest Europe. And these, as I said, were all deposited by the edge of the lake. So again, interesting insights into behaviours as well from a more personable and human level. So not just in terms of what they were doing in terms of subsistence or trying to get by or to dispose of their waste. It's also uh, about what they're doing on a daily basis that's on a more perhaps spiritual level. Our second site that I'm going to come to is, um, is No Name Hill. And if you watch Digging for Britain, uh, episode five, you'll have seen that this site uh, featured here. And I'm really, really grateful to, uh, to Barry and Nick and Amy for allowing me to talk, talk to you about this site tonight. Um, here's the excavations from this, this summer. And uh, here we excavated uh, a very, very large area. Mostly we didn't take the, the, the machine, took the top of it off um, and got through all the really, really dry peaks. So thank you to also to the machine driver. Um, and then we hand excavated with a whole great um, group of students from the universities of Chester and Manchester to uh, begin to try and understand what is going on at this site. Now, if you remember, this is on an island, so it's quite close to Starcar, but it's not, um, not immediately uh, next to it, it's, it's on the island that would have been in the lake at the time. And this is, has a similar history of investigation. So uh, the activity was first identified again that, but, um, uh, in the 1940s and the Vale of uh, Pickering Research Trust uh, did more survey of it um, in the 1980s and 90s. And we can see sort of from this picture where the excavation is uh, that it sits on a very, very slight rise in the landscape. And then you've got the, the Yorkshire walls that, that roll off um, into the distance. And uh, renewed investigation uh, by, uh, by Barry, Nick and Amy uh, began in 2018 and, and yeah, ca carrying on uh, at the moment. And what's really, really interesting is that we're getting a very, very similar signature to Star Car in terms of the level of preservation of animal bones, um, which are showing some incredible uh, deposits. So collections of butchered animal bones, of, of uh, de discarded uh, waste, but also of articulated remains as well. So again, as I mentioned, that, that those articulated remains being, being placed in still with the flesh on, so um, not, um, not necessarily being cut up or, or, or all of it taken apart. Um, but what's really interesting is that some of the meaty bits are missing. So we would expect if the, this was just to do with butchery waste and that people were extracting things for a meal, you would also see the, the, the forelimbs and the hind limbs, those uh, big haunchy bits of, um, uh, of red deer being uh, deposited as well. But we don't see that. It's more, to do, it's more the, the, the less meaty bits, um, which is very interesting in and of, of itself. We also get tool manufacture debris. And again, we also see this at Star Car. Um, and here we've got some red deer antlers, which have been shed. So red deer, if in the Mesolithic, in the Stone, in the Middle Stone Age, they still shed their antlers at the same time as they do in the present day. This happens around about spring between March and May. So these, uh, these antlers have fallen off um, and then people have been um, working them 
by uh, a series of techniques. So using the same types of techniques as we saw on those really interesting frontlets, they're carving them down. They're using something called groove and splinter, uh, which allows them to trim the beam. And you can see in the central image, there's some feathering just towards the, um, the, the point at the end. There's some feathering that uh, shows that's, that's mesolithic tool marks. That's the individual strokes of somebody with a flint blade from about 11,000 years ago, just working on that. And I think that's incredible that that has been preserved, that fossilized moment of time. So we've got some butchery, we've got some tool manufacture, and we can also see in the right-hand image, there's a flint flake, that little um, dark gray shining glinting piece that's just underneath the center of the antler there. They were also found nearby as well, which is really interesting because then we also have the finished tools found as well. And what these antlers were being cut down for is to make barbed points. And some of them are complete, some of them are broken, and one of them is decorated, or at least the broken end of it is decorated. So again, another uh, motif perhaps that um, resembles, again, things that we see at Star Car in terms of decoration and also styles that we see on the continent. We also see tiny pieces of stone uh, that have been worked uh, to provide uh, components for tools as well. So this is a really composite type of technology. So arrows and uh, various tools in this way would have been made from multiple pieces of stone tool, which is, which is really, really useful because it means if a bit breaks, then it means your tool's not completely useless. You can carry on using it till you've got time to fix it later on. So, Again, we've got this, this whole range and abundance um, of, of artifacts that are being found in association with this site. And I've got another scary graph for you. Hooray! Uh, this is a uh, pollen diagram. Um, now, I mentioned at Star Car, we've got evidence for, people, for, for burning in and around the environment. Um, and we also have this at No Name Hill. And this is a, a, a paper that was only published last year. So. In this diagram, in the red square, we can see the time period in which there seems to be human activity at No Name Hill. So we haven't yet got dates for the actual occupation at the site. So this is correlated to just the environment so far. But the, the core, this, the, where the, the pollen was extracted from was taken from very, very close to where these, um, the, all the archaeology was found as well. So we can be pretty confident it's closely, uh, closely associated with. So within that red square, we can see this change in climate happening. And this is what I mentioned as the ice age uh, dissipates and the, the Holocene begins and, and the temperatures start to warm. We can see this reflected in the pollen record with the tree species. So birch being this pioneer species is benefiting from this warming climate and it's quite high in its present uh, in its representation. But then eventually, as the climate changes a little, we start to see that hazel begins to dominate and it eventually replaces birch at the site. And hazel is, is a really, really useful uh, tree and it's uh, used a lot by Mesolithic people. And we've got a lot of evidence from Mesolithic sites across Europe for it being managed and coppiced on a very regular basis to provide straight long poles for things like fish traps or for bows and those kinds of things. It's very predictable in that way. If you cut it down at the base, it'll send out long straight growth. And what's really interesting is that we've got, again, this charcoal to suggest um, that uh, humans are burning the um, in, in, the, in the landscape, it might be domestic fires, it may also be low scale management of the forest as well. So what's quite interesting is that on the right of your screen there, um, those three peaks in those red circles are quite coincidental with the, the increases, um, the, 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 the kind of uh, stepwise increases in hazel presence. So it's possible that whatever humans were doing in this environment in terms of burning, is increasing the chance for, for hazel to expand. So this might relate to land management um, in terms of uh, opening up areas uh, or in, in encouraging and increasing new growth for grazing animals to come and browse on, therefore creating easy pickings for your dinner. Um, it might also increase nut yields uh, for the 
uh, from the bushes as well, and, and also coppicing, as I mentioned. Um, and the dates from this site, uh, which are really, really interesting, again, a very, very contemporary with uh, this, the, the site at, at Star Car. So we know that people that were living and moving in and around this landscape, very similar times. So just to summarise then, um, we've got a really, really uh, interesting view of Mesolithic life in and around Lake Flixton. We know that Star Car was visited by people over the course of around 800 years. And they made these structures on the dry land and the platform to access uh, the lake. Then at both sites, we've got evidence for human impacts on the environment through episodes of burning, through vegetation disturbance. So people are very, very much present in here and having some impacts. So it then perhaps challenges uh, assumptions that people who live by this uh, life weight were not having any impact uh, on the landscape at all. We're they were very, very light touch and non-extractive, but also we do see these uh, human signatures and human traces. And what we have then is, is the aspects of everyday life at both these sites, including hunting, gathering, food preparation, tool repair, um, but also very careful and considerate uh, discard of, of waste and of human remains. Uh, uh, not human remains, we don't have any human remains at all, um, of, of, of just very um, uh, interesting, significant items. So this is giving us a really, really interesting picture then. I'm going to now bring you back to the Anthropocene. We've been on a wonderful journey uh, 11, uh, back 11,000 years when the climate was very different, the environment was very different, um, and uh, the, the, the issues that we're facing in the contemporary period were also different, uh, but perhaps not unfamiliar. And I think it's really, really important then uh, for just to, to understand um, how much archaeology can give us a, a really important time depth to show that lives have been lived differently to the way in which most people do in the present day, um, and also that people live differently now. It also shows that um, people lived through rapid climatic and environmental change as well. If you remember back to that, uh, that, that graph that I showed you right at the very beginning, how quickly that temperature spike went up. People living through um, very rapid uh, changes in their environment, yet they were resilient, resilient to it. We don't see any evidence of abandonment during this period at all. And I think it's really important that archaeology can begin to provide different perspectives, uh, to unite human and natural spheres, to activate hope and inspire change, just by thinking about uh, a perception shift to the ways in which other people uh, live and have lived in the past. So if you'd like to learn more about Stark Art, I'm just going to put a shameless plug out there for our future learn course. You can register uh, for free and uh, explore more about the site of Stark Art. Uh, and you can access uh, that slide or just email me for any information that you might like. Um, and just to say a huge thank you to uh, Millie, uh, Amy and Lizzie and everyone at the One Planet Week for organising this, uh, to Nick Barry and Amy and Tom for um, their, their photographs from No Name Hill, um, and to, uh, to Nikki as well for the, the Star Car uh, permissions. So um, yeah, I'm going to stop share. Oh, I had a last poll for you before I, um, I, I stop. And, um, and then we'll wrap up for questions, although I don't think we've got much time left. Um, here is my um, last poll. And um, based on thinking about your, uh, the, the thoughts that you had before um, and the things that you've known now from this, uh, from this talk, I'm interested in asking you whether or not understanding hunter-gatherer responses in, to climate change in the past might be helpful to addressing these issues now. You don't necessarily have to answer why if you don't wish to. I appreciate there's um, not much time left for the talk, but it's always interesting to hear your thoughts nevertheless. I'll leave it open for another 20 seconds, I think. Just before I hand back to Lizzie to manage questions. So I've seen a few things ping into the chat. Um, so I'll um, leave it.
give you another 10 seconds remaining just to see what folks think before, um, before we gather results. I can see them drifting in live and it's um, very, very interesting. So they're still coming in. I'll leave it open for, uh, yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't want to stop. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to close it now then, and um, and uh, yeah, we'll show them. She'll hand back to the room. Thank you very much, folks. So the um, quickly share the results that 78% of you uh, felt that uh, yes, we can use hunter gatherer responses to climate change in the past to address issues in the present day, and 22% said no. So thank you very much, folks, and uh, yes, I will end there. Okay. Um, I've seen um, one person has asked in the chat, was it seasonal occupation only? Um, so uh, the, the animal remains that we use to identify this are, uh, can be seasonally specific. So we can use them to provide us with seasonal identifiers. Um, but when you put them all together, it shows that there is largely um, occupation for most times of the year. So we don't know for absolute certain that Starkar was occupied continuously for 800 years or whether or not people came and went intermittently, whether or not they were the same people or whether they were different groups. Uh, but we can say for large parts of the year, people were there at some point. Um, and that's not uh, also to, to we've got to take in consideration the fact that um, things can also be stored as well. So if you've got hazelnuts there, in which there are a lot of hazelnuts, OK, they they're an autumnal signature. But if you roast them, it not only makes them delicious, it makes them store for a really long time. So you can't always guarantee um, that it means that people were only there in the autumn. Um, so a complicated answer to what seemed probably um, seemed like a, an initially quite um, straightforward question. Um, thank you. Um, I did see, uh, I hope that answers it as well, but let me know if it, if it doesn't. I did see a hand waving, um, but uh, it's, um, it's gone. I don't know if that was a wave to say hello or whether or not um, it was a... Uh, I have a question. But yes, if you do have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. Uh, yes, I can put the um, the future learn uh, uh, slide back on. Give me two seconds. Um, there we go, and I'll screen share again. There you go. And um, I'm quite happy to take more questions. Whilst uh, if you want to, if you can scan the QR code, if you're able to do that, uh, then um, that'll take you there. But also, it's futurelearn.com forward slash courses, forward, forward slash exploring Stone Age archaeology, the mysteries of Star Car, all with hyphens between it. But if you put in future learn and Star Car into uh, any search engine, you will definitely um, uh, find it very quickly. I'll um, stop sharing again now, because I think there's been a, um, another. Um, oh, uh, there's a and a Aha. Um, so um, I've just seen the Q&A, which is different than the chat. Um, so what sort of numbers of people might have occupied the site? It is very, very difficult to say. Uh, there are, um, there's, Clark suggested that it might have been families, about five families based on the types of artifacts that he found. Um, but also the, he did not excavate the full scale of the site. So now that we have a greater understanding of how large the site is, we can we can increase that. But it's very, very difficult to model populations and demography um, for this time period. 
uh, that's <laughs> it feels like a bit of a cop out, but it's um, it is really, really, really difficult to say. Um, and of course, it depends when they were there um, and if they were uh, there all at once. Um, someone says, could they have been thoroughly thriving in the summer and scarcely surviving in the winter? Um, potentially. Uh, but um, I mentioned storage and storage would have been a very, very useful. So curing meats or fish uh, through smoking would have been a really, really great way of getting through the winter months. And uh, then also using, yes, munching down on a nice hazelnut roast. I'm sure that would have been lovely. There are lots of migratory birds that come through through the winter. So they could also have um, used those fishing. Um, and also moving as well to um, if, if the resources that were not available around the site, uh, that if they diminished through the winter, then people would potentially have moved as well to, um, to, get, to, to get to the area um, and resources that they needed. I think um, to answer the next question, I think there was definitely an indication of, um, of spiritual dimension to their lives, particularly those frontlets. Um, really there's not a clear functional solely purely functional uh, response to that and from what we understand from people who live um, through hunter, hunting and gathering lifeways and indigenous communities is that there is no distinction between what is day-to-day -day and what is religious or spiritual the the, the two are so uh, imbued with one another that all aspects of life have a spiritual dimension to them so I think um, it's really, really important to acknowledge that that is likely to have been the case, even if we don't necessarily have uh, physical artifactual evidence of that um, that's particularly tangible. Um, I think it's, um, it's certainly likely to have been the case. What don't we know about the Flixton site? Uh, what have we still left to learn? Um, a lot. We've got a lot yet, uh, to learn. Um, we'd particularly with No Name Hill, we uh, it would be great to, to get uh, more answers through uh, further excavation. We've got we've yet to, to do all the analysis of the animal bones. I'm going to be looking at the stone tool assemblages. So um, we don't yet know how people were occupying the site and what they were doing. Why were they only bringing or, or depositing bits of deer? Why were they not? Why, why were they doing it at all? Was it were they bringing it there on purpose um, or were they uh, was it just a matter of discard and, and was it a production site or was it a, a, a why were they putting the tools in particularly the tools that were still useful to have those complete barbed points they would have been they take a long time to manufacture um, and you would have been quite sad if you lost it so why is it that people um, are putting those into the lake so that kind of goes back to that previous question about spiritual dimensions so there's loads and loads and loads still um, left to learn so we're really really excited to carry on um, uh, working on that. Thank you. Um, uh, another question, Hunter Gatherer Society do eat meat and there is no evidence they restricted their use of resources to keep in balance with nature. Today there are 8 billion people and surely we cannot be going back to Hunter Gatherers. I wasn't advocating the fact that we were to go back to Hunter Gatherers um, at all. I, I absolutely appreciate the fact that um, their population is very, very different and that uh, meat consumption is one aspect of it. But I think that there are um, important things to consider in terms of the relationship that we have with nature uh, from the, the perspective of, of, of uh, extractive uh, practices and mutual respect was something that I, I mentioned earlier on. And uh, I think it's, it's important to consider and, and not, not least mutual respect for not just the environment but also the other inhabitants of the earth that uh, the other eight billion people that we share the earth with so I think that's that's quite important um, to consider and I'm not saying that um, going going back to hunting and gathering is is, is the is the be all and end all and, and, and that's a solution I, I don't think it is um, but it's more just to understand uh, the way in which people live their lives um, and whether or not um, that at least mindset can give um, can give some kind of um, insights into to solutions that we might find um, in the way uh, in the present day. Um, is there any evidence for seafood and shellfish at Starcar? Were they cooked? There is none. Um, which is really, really interesting because it's not too far from the coast. Um, so 
we do know that uh, Mesolithic people definitely ate a lot of seafood and shellfish, and uh, particularly the sites that I've worked on in Scotland, where the whole site is nothing but uh, shellfish, mostly limpets. Uh, but yeah, we don't have any there, and it's not entirely clear as to whether or not that might be to do with preservation, um, or if it's that that's just not something that they're they're bringing uh, bringing there with them. So um, yeah, quite interesting. Um, and cooking, uh, there is burnt bone there, definitely. So uh, there is definitely an answer for um, an answer for that. So we do uh, we do see a burning of bone is likely to do with um, cooking practices. Oh, a, a good question. Next, um, is it possible to explore archaeological sites in an eco-friendly way? Um, I think that requires a lot of consideration uh, about the methods that are employed um, and the ways in which we go about doing uh, doing archaeology, such as the incredible use of uh, an incredible in in a in a scary way use of plastics uh, for. Uh, for storing finds, for example. Digital techniques um, have come a huge, hugely long way since uh, you know, over, over the last few decades, really. So using non-invasive uh, techniques to do that. In the case of these sites, um, if they weren't excavated, uh, the damage that is done to them through the drying, the, the acidification and the, the, the um, drying out the peats means that the archaeology would completely disappear. So this is really a case of, um, of rescuing these archaeological sites. But I think that, yeah, um, through archaeological practice definitely needs um, a, a good long think about the way in which uh, it's, it's carried out. Um, and I know uh, I know some excellent colleagues who are, who are beginning to think about that as well. Um, there's just a few questions. Um, Lizzie, how are we doing for time? Are we all right to just stay on a, a few minutes longer? Um, we should be here. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, so uh, another question is there might anything that might be toys for children um not anything that we've uh, readily identified uh, at least from the sites but we definitely do know that there are to uh, artifacts that have been interpreted as toys for children from from other sites and um, from different time periods as well um from the paleolithic for example from the earlier stone age very small things um small smaller models of things um uh, also, there have been uh, artifacts from uh, from North America where there are they look like um, smaller tools, uh, like a small atlatls, spear throwers that have been used. So we definitely see that there are children's um, presence of children within the archaeological record, uh, but just not necessarily at Starkar. Um, the next question is flint readily available in the area? Yes, it was. Um, in the Yorkshire Walls, particularly. Uh, it is very readily available, so um, it it's, uh, appears in um, uh, in streams and, and, and rivers um, and also could be quite poor quality stuff can be collected from the coast. So uh, it is very read readily available. Uh, and also the, the fact that pe people were likely to have been moving around this landscape uh, were also uh, probably provisioning uh, themselves with um, some good stuff from sources that they knew uh, that might not necessarily have been nearby. Um, Someone else has uh, asked whether or not there's evidence of cereals um, and were these planted or were they natural grasses. So not cereal crops that we um, understand of today as domesticates like wheat and barley. That doesn't come in until the Neolithic, uh, until the, the, the New Stone Age, uh, which is around about, uh, probably about 5,000 years after the occupation at Starkar has ended. So it takes a very, very long time for, uh, for agriculture to arrive in this part of the world. So all the natural grasses uh, that are uh, present are environmental, are, are, no, well, all cereals are natural, but uh, uh, selectively um, cultivated. Uh, but yes, uh, it's just the, the, the general landscape grass uh, around. But that's not to say that um, grasses were not used and utilised uh, potentially in, in ways for consumption. Um, and one, uh, there's a, a couple of... Uh, uh, questions as one in the chat um, and this last question in the Q&A is there evidence found on site of trading with faraway places um, such as artifacts not from the region? Um, not that I know of the, the furthest away is the, the shale pendant um, so but the shale is quite close by uh, relatively speaking to the site so uh, you can uh, get it at, at Robin Hood's Bay or, uh, or, or uh, Whitby so we 
that may have been directly obtained by people live there who, who were living there, but it may also have been the fact that it was brought to the site by other people or it was traded. It's difficult to know these um, this uh, because it's it, it, it doesn't leave a, a trace in that particular way. Um, but my colleague uh, is um, is working on a project currently. Dr. Andy Needham is currently working on a project to try and trace the source of um, of the Starcar pendant and other shale uh, beads that were found there, um, as well as other ones that were found uh, in Wales from a local source in Wales as well. And so it's quite interesting. But we do definitely see trading networks in the Mesolithic from from other sites as well. Um, there was one, uh, a couple of questions that Lizzie put in um, about uh, any remains of the building. There's none that survive. There's no um, very, very poor organic survival from the dryland area. So there's no uh, uh, remains of a post or anything. Um, so uh, that's uh, unfortunate, but um, that's the, the nature of the archaeological evidence, and that's more representative of the types of uh, archaeological remains that we get. Um, and then there's um, uh, a question, uh, what did they do with their dead? Um, we don't actually have any human remains from the area, um, but we do know that uh, there is a wide variety of mortuary practices uh, taking place during this period. People were interred uh, whole. There was also disarticulation practices going on, which uh, seems to be quite a normal thing to do. So not necessarily, so potentially manipulation of human remains. Cremation is a practice that also takes place, and uh, uh, is, uh, there's an excellent site from, um, from Ireland where there's a beautiful cremation deposit associated with a, a ritually placed flint axe. So there's um, a lots and lots of different uh, ways in, in which people dealt with the dead uh, that is uh, indicative of really, really complex understanding and relationships uh, with this process. Um, and also potentially pe putting people in, in, in uh, special places in the landscape. Uh, and it seems that Star Car itself was quite a special place in the landscape, or Lick Flixton was a special place in the landscape. So it's quite interesting that we don't see evidence of human remains there. Um, and just um, answering very, very rapidly, um, is there any evidence for sexual uh, equality or inequality? Not that we can tell from this site. Um, and it's very, very difficult to determine, to be honest. Uh, we There is um, a huge... Uh, variation in the way that uh, hunter, uh, the, the indigenous and hunting and gathering societies uh, socially structure themselves. Uh, and in some cases, they, their social structure is completely egalitarian. And in some cases, uh, it's very, very uh, distinctly hierarchical. So uh, it's very, very difficult to know from um, from the archaeological record what, what the case was. And by looking at burial evidence, um, it seems that there may be some variability. So sometimes you see the way in which people are buried with um, similar types of grave goods or no grave, grave goods at all may suggest um, that uh, there is a, a similar, similar um, egalitarianism and people were not hierarchical. But then also we do see some levels of social stratification as well within um, very, very complex uh, and, and, and uh, richly furnished graves as well. Um, but in terms of um, how this plays out between um, sexes, uh, very, very difficult to say, but there does seem to be a different uh, gender representation um, in burial as well. So not necessarily always that grave goods correlate uh, with sex um, and may be representative of gender instead. <sighs> I'm going to take a breath um, and um, I think I might stop talking now. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it um, and thank you all so much for your um, your contributions uh, through your questions and through your um, and through your poll responses. I'm, I'm really fascinated to to look back at, over those in, in more detail and, and reflect on those. Um, so thank you very much folks and um, I hope you have a lovely uh, rest of your evening and uh, yeah enjoy the rest of One Planet Week as well. Thank you. <laughs>